Hello and welcome back to our series about how to create a simple platformer using the Godot engine and the Rust programming language. In particular, we will look today into how we can apply a force to our upcoming character and also how to do a character based collision detection with our environment. So in the last video, we actually prepared our time map this time we will now make a collision detectable and have a player in place or a character in place. So first of all, we need to modify our tile set with the collision objects. Therefore, we change back to our tile set and then we select each individual tile which should have a collision. You mark on the top the collision and then also the grid, which is quite cool to use currently because just by pressing then the small rect for each tile and double clicking on it, it will pre-select all the available space for that particular tile. So we will now apply this one for the various tiles which should have a collision detection or at least interact based on a collision. And once we are done with all our tiles, which should have physic interactions, we just save the changes by pressing Command S on the Mac, for example. And then we are ready to set up our character. Therefore, let's import a new, therefore, let's import our character representative uh, PNG file and let's add a new kinematic body 2D node. Then let's drag and drop the character in. Also resize it as required. And as you can see, currently it is blurry. So therefore we need to deactivate our filter and re-import it. Then it gets sharp again. Let's make some quick modification on it. And now let's also add the collision shape. In that case, we use a collision shape 2D because we only want to have a very simple collision um, area or shape. So, for example, a rect shape for our character for now. And then we need to apply the proper sizing to our, let's call it hitbox. To put our collision shape in front of the uh, image, just let's drag and drop the order of our nodes. As you can see, now we see the collision box or the collision shape always. Next, we start by creating a new script. In particular, of course, because we are using Rust, we need a native script and we need to type in a class and let's call the class player. Just very generic and yeah, let's create it that way. Next, we need to create a new uh, go.native library. And when you click on the element again, then you see all the build available build configurations for later that is actually required. Next, we are heading back to our root project folder and we will create now a new folder called script. And in the script, we create a cargo.toml file this one is actually used again, as in the previous videos already mentioned, as our workspace. So that means all the dependencies from our sub um, projects in Rust will rely on the top level dependencies. So that means dependencies are shared. Then let's create a new um, module by using cargo new, then the module name and the two dashes with a lib because we want to create a lib. And parallel in the cargo toml file, we already applied the new workspace as well. Then heading forward to the player module, we need to add our dependencies. So in that case, we are just using the go.native um, dependency in version 0.8. Then let's add the lib type. So the create type is a CDY lib. OK, 
And then let's open up another terminal session where we want actually to build the project and then use our file watcher, so cargo watch, in order to apply all the changes once we made any kind of code changes in our script folder. So the build, may, the initial build might take a while. Now we are back, the initial build was done and the cargo watch command also already is running up and running. As you can see it here. So next we have our template structure of our go.native script in Rust. Important is that the struct what we are using is called player. It needs exactly to match the naming as previously in the go.engine where we defined our class. Then let's import some basic structs what are required for our code afterwards. And let's add to the player a new property called velocity. And the velocity is later on used for our gravity calculation. So per definition, the initial value will be 0, zero because it's a float and this uh, we apply for the y and x axis. Let's also add another property called default velocity. This is just like our default values for the velocity. We, can, we could actually make it as a constant, but let's keep things simple for now and just add it as a separate property. This is also a vector two again. And then of course, in our default struct generation, we also will add a default value to it. In that case, we say 0, 0 0.0 as a float and 1.0. Great. And now let's heading to the physics process. So physics process is actually used before the engine gets updated, so it's a pre-calculation step. That's why we add our physics declaration or physics interactions within the physics process. So first we will create a new vector where we will now calculate our, let's call it gravity. So that means the x-axis will be unchanged and the y-axis we will update. And of course, for the changes of the y-axis, we will also apply the delta. As you can see, we get an error here for the type because delta is currently a float 64 and we need to cast it to a float 32 in order to make the multiplication. And next, we need actually to use a particular component or method of the kinematic body 2D in order to move our character properly. Therefore, we are heading back to our, the documentation. And I already did it previously, so that's why I'm already familiar with the method. We are looking for move and collide of the kinematic body 2D. And here we go. There is also the move and slide what you can use. But here we are looking for the move and collide. So that's the proper method we need to call now. And this is of course required in order to do the calculation and to invoke it, you need to use the owner because the owner is that particular type of our component. We pass the parameters, so true, true and false because the last parameter, if you set it to true, it would only test it and not, not update the new position for, the, for our character. 
we put a match condition or uh, we use metam patching in addition to verify if there is a collision or not. So in case that there is a collision available, the return type will be another struct which contains exactly collision details. And for now, we just make it again very simple by using Rust's pattern matching syntax. In case that there is a collision, we will have a, a value available in the option, optional, and per default, we just return. And if there is a condition, we just print it to our go.console that collision was detected. And then below, we just return. And now we save our changes. So we did not get any additional errors, just the warnings. Okay, let's also rename default velocity to the default recommendation of the code styles. So that means we should have it camel cased. Let's have the change. And let's try it out by applying now our library. Therefore, select your platform, go in the script folder under target, debug, and select the library file. So the libplayer.dylib file. And now we just tried it to run, but as you saw, the character did not update. And this is because we are applying two wrong parameters here, the default velocity, we need to put a minus in front. Let's save the changes. And here, as you can see, the test only parameter is actually the mistake what I did. So let's pass false. Now the physics will also get applied and let's rerun it. Great, it worked and the collisions are detected as you see in the console. Thank you for watching, see you next time.